Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome a very, very accomplished professional, a very, very accomplished specialist in psychology and psychiatry, and a very dear friend, Dr. Kerry Salkovics. Kerry, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Ashutosh. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Kerry is the founder and managing principal of the Boswell Group. He is the president-elect of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He advises on leadership challenges, CEO succession, board dynamics, and culture change. He's a very, very highly respected coach, and he got me started on coaching. So, Kerry, tell me, what would you say are the three key milestones in your life or your career? I appreciate that question. And, you know, as a psychoanalyst by training, uh, I'm inclined to go back to some of the earliest years, at least uh, for the first milestone. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say the first milestone really happens to be about uh, the nature of my existence, really, mm -hmm. which is uh, my, my, my parents' background. As, uh, as you and I have spoken about in the past, Ashutosh, my parents were both Holocaust survivors from Poland who mm -hmm. uh, rather miraculously survived the concentration camps in Poland and then emigrated to the United States in 1947. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was born in, at the end of 1958, um, and, and, and I'm the only child of these two uh, survivors of, uh, of a very difficult period in world history. Correct. And, um, and that uh, accident of my birth um, profoundly shaped me in many ways. Um, it it uh, shaped me in terms of a sensitivity to human suffering, mm -hmm. it sensitized me to, to the, the, the role of, of immigration in shaping the world and certainly American culture. And, um, and it later informed my interest in, in human rights. And I think it uh, gave me a sense of responsibility um, to live up to my parents' expectations, which at times was burdensome, but at times was a source of motivation. So that would be the first one that shaped okay. me. Okay. I think the second one, which in some ways I'm grateful to my parents for as well, but in a different regard, was the kind of education that I was able to, to get. My parents had no uh, formal education. Mm -hmm. uh, their, their lives were interrupted by the war. Um, I had the privilege of going to, uh, to Harvard College and then to medical school at the University of Texas and then moving to New York to do a residency in psychiatry at New York University. Mm -hmm. uh, I also did my psychoanalytic training there. And, um, and so I'm, I've always been uh, so grateful to have had the kind of educational experiences that I've had, which opened up all kinds of doors for me that I clearly would not have had access to Correct. otherwise. And then the, uh, the third uh, that I would mention uh, although it, it's almost an unfair question, Ashutosh, because there's so many more than three. Yes. Um, but um, but I'll, I'll limit myself to, to, to three. The, the, the third one was really the serendipitous um, encounter that I had when I was in my 30s uh, that led me to change the course of my professional life from being a clinician in private practice in New York, uh, doing psychiatry and psychoanalysis, to, uh, to what was really a kind of fortuitous stumble into the world of business. Okay. And uh, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I think we'll probably wind up talking a bit more about the, my business okay. experience later, but I think I'm a big believer in serendipitous events that can change one's life. I know, and, and you know, there's this constant talk that if you wish something enough, it will happen. And of course, the other part is, what, what the, the Hindus believe in this, which is karma, that whatever is destined to happen will happen. So, so I, let's, I, let's, I, let's talk about a little bit about uh, your uh, formal qualification as a psychoanalyst in, and in psychiatry. You know, I'm not going to, in, in the US, this is a fairly advanced practice and uh, people understand. But in the rest of the world, it is still something which is talked about in very hush hush terms. So based on all your experience of working with so many people, when does a person know that they need professional help? It's a good question. And uh, I'd like to first address uh, a, an aspect of your question, which really touches on the stigma uh, of, of, of mental illness. And um, 
I think I think it's true that um, that in the in the West there is less stigma these days. But even that is something that has changed really quite dramatically in recent times. Meaning in the last uh, uh, twenty years or so. Okay. Uh, interestingly, the pandemic has been helpful. But one of the silver linings of the pandemic in further destigmatizing mental illness since it's uh, since the rates of it have been skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. But to uh, to try to answer your question about when does a person know uh, when they need uh, professional help as opposed to a, a good friend to to uh, you know to talk to, uh, a, a lot of uh, emotional challenges. Uh, probably can be dealt with if you have a good friend or a, an intimate relationship, somebody with whom you can confide. Um, but um, it, these things, and these, the, the difference between problems that are helped in that way versus the problems that really need professional attention, it's sometimes, frankly, not a sharp dividing line. It's not like flipping a light switch that you either have a serious problem or you don't. I think that emotional issues tend to exist on a what I would describe as a spectrum, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think it's when one's level of anxiety or depression or whatever kinds of feelings and symptoms or or problematic repetitive patterns in one li one's life mm -hmm. are are such that they interfere mm -hmm. with one's ability to to have some degree of success in work and in life, which was actually Freud's definition of a. A psychologically healthy individual, somebody who was successful or happy in work and in life, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, it's it's the degree of interference uh, and the degree to which one's own uh, personal freedom is compromised mm -hmm. that um, that that is really the determining factor. Okay, and you know, based on uh, a lot of work that you are doing, and. The, the entire demography of the world is changing with millennials coming in more and more and, and they seem to have on the one side an extremely positive outlook, but they also have a lot of stresses. What, in your opinion, are some of the challenges the millennials are facing today? Well, uh, I, I should also point out that my some of my expertise in millennials is that I have two of them as children. Uh, so, uh, not to mention encountering them in the workplace and, and in other other places. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are some special challenges that millennials face, and this is even pre pre pandemic, Ashutosh. Mm -hmm. I, I think that they have grown up in a world in which they've never known a society that isn't connected by technology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, older folks like you and me, I'm sorry to say, uh, you know, uh, technology is wonderful and we uh, employ it regularly, mm. um, but we didn't grow up with it as as an embedded part of our consciousness. And um, and I think there, while there are wonderful aspects to technology that I won't bother to enumerate, I think mm. that millennials, while taking advantage of the wonderful things about technology, they, uh, they also have grown up in a world that is... Um, that is strangely connected and disconnected at the same time. The okay. connection is obvious, but they somehow don't have the opportunities to to separate from their families. And the and by separate, I'm not just talking about geographic separation. Right. Really, it's really not about geography at all. And, and but I'm really talking about the kind of emotional separation that's really an essential aspect of becoming. Uh, psychologically healthy, autonomous human beings mm -hmm. who are able to uh, to thrive uh, relatively independently in the world, and um, and I think that that uh, the, the the technology has un one of the negative aspects mm -hmm. is that it has compromised millennials' ability to to achieve that psychological developmental milestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if I was to look at children again, and I'm talking about children a little more because. I've had many, many questions that keep coming into me and saying, you know, we've got challenges with our children. And I thought I'll take this opportunity of asking you that if I, as a parent, have teenage children or whether the Gen Zs now or the millennials, what kind of symptoms do I need to look for in behavior patterns to, to understand that my child needs help? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's I, I think in some ways it's related to what I was just saying a, a moment ago about some of the the uh, unintended negative consequences of technology on child and adolescent development. We're really talking a lot about adolescent development here too, mm -hmm. and young adulthood. Uh, the kinds of symptoms that I would be on the lookout for 
and symptoms broadly defined. Mm -hmm. And these are these are the kinds of things that you don't need a professional degree to diagnose. But these are simple, simply things that that parents who are, you know, reasonably observant can mm -hmm. see. And that is um, a, a a kind of social withdrawal, um, a, uh, a living a kind of life in which uh, the, the, you know, virtuality seems to replace uh, real life social interactions. Mm -hmm. I think that that is uh, that's something that is a concern to me. Mm -hmm. Another, and I think this is one of the frankly uh, cruel, again unintentionally cruel mm -hmm. uh, consequences of uh, of teenagers, for instance, growing up in a technologically connected world, okay. is that the um, the ordinary kind of slights and insults that are a normal part of adolescence okay. get. Uh, have the potential to be amplified, magnified in such a way by technology that the that the um, resulting emotional injury can be much more profound. Mm. Uh, it's one thing to be, you know, um, uh, insulted in a way that is uh, embarrassing in the schoolyard, but it's another when that insult is then distributed globally mm. uh, through some channel on the internet. And the level of, of humiliation, mortification, mm -hmm. and the fact that it lasts forever, if you will, mm -hmm. online. Um, I think I think there's some pretty devastating consequences, and so I think I think parents need to to do they, what they can to protect their kids from that. I agree. Actually, you're right. There is almost no privacy left now, you know, for anyone. It's Everything it's a real there. problem uh, because humans have a need for for privacy and. Um, uh, as, 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 as gregarious as we may see ourselves, uh, we need to be able to retreat from that and to have quiet moments of intimacy. Correct. I agree. So now let's move to the second segment of our conversation, Kerry. Let's talk about, you know, as you said, you moved from your profession into the corporate world. So I'm going to use, you know, you're an advisor on various aspects of leadership, etc., to large companies. So for you know, ease of communication today, I'm going to just say as a coach. My first question to you is that uh, who should look for a coach? Yeah, well, it's a great question on so many levels. And um, uh, you and I have talked about this a lot over the years, and it's been a great pleasure talking to you about this. And it's related to the title of your podcast mm -hmm. about the brand called You. And so I'd like to answer your question in part in relation mm -hmm. uh, to the notion of, of how one is branded as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, uh, and I, I'm certainly not in any way offended by your calling me a coach, and in shorthand, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not only is it fine, but I'm sure I've been called far worse things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, um, but when I'm introducing myself, mm -hmm. I actually don't refer to myself uh, primarily as a coach, mm -hmm. and it's in part a branding issue, if I may. I'm a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist, as you were kind enough to mention earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but but I prefer the term advisor, mm -hmm. uh, in part because uh, coach to me, while it's perfectly helpful and reasonable, mm -hmm. it's it obviously is a word that comes from the sporting world, okay. and um, and it's uh, and 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 therefore it sometimes implies. Uh, teaching people skills as well as motiv motivating them. And uh, while I'm all for doing both of those things to the extent that I am capable of that, mm -hmm. my role as an advisor is also to help uh, my clients reflect mm -hmm. and to serve as a sounding board on the more complicated aspects of their roles as leaders of organizations, mm -hmm. uh, which is a roundabout way of trying to, to more specifically answer your question, which is when does somebody need a coach or an advisor? Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, you know, the, the, the old saying, Ashutosh, that's lonely at the top. Um, th th there is a lot of truth to that statement. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so uh, I think that one of the, one of the factors that I think leads someone to benefit from a coach is when they're in a position of authority, whereby the authority alone, the role that they have, um, is, it has the effect of isolating them. Uh, it creates that kind of loneliness that I was uh, right. referring to. And so having a coach is somebody to talk to, to help them navigate uh, the kinds of issues that they don't necessarily have someone inside their organization to talk about because of the nature of power dynamics. Hmm. So that's, so that's really it. Very interesting. And therefore that, you know, your comment gives me an interesting segue to my next question, which is that, you know, you work with so many 
CEOs, and you worked with so many of them in the last so many years. What, according to you, are the most important qualities a CEO should have? Well, you know, I've thought about this question a lot over the years, and um, there is, as as you know, as a as a as someone who's been a CEO yourself, there there is no formula for being an effective CEO. There are a lot of good CEOs out there who are quite different from one another. There are a lot of not so good CEOs who are quite different from one another. And there's probably a book a day that gets published on, you know, how to, how to be a great leader, how to be a CEO. Um, I, so in addition to some of the, the usual qualities, there are, are two or three that I would highlight that are perhaps a little less talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, we, could, we can debate whether or not they're the most important ones, but in my book, they do, they do matter. One is to be a CEO uh, rooted in uh, in moral values. Okay. Frankly, I think that the, uh, the I, I, I refer to it as moral leadership, and mm -hmm. that doesn't mean moralistic. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. being judgmental, yeah, but it means uh, leadership that is uh, that is at its core uh, informed by some basic human values about how to treat people uh, and a sense of responsibility to others, not just to oneself. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, a few others that I think are absolutely critical. One, and they're all related to one another. Um, another one is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I think the best CEOs, the best leaders, I don't just mean in business, leaders in, in various walks of life, mm -hmm. um, have, a, have more than a modicum of capacity to look at themselves and understand something about their own motivations and behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really vital. Uh, and related to that, I would say, is curiosity. Okay. Um, curiosity about the world around one, intellectual curiosity, but also curiosity about oneself. And the reason why I think curiosity is so important, it's frankly one of my favorite words, mm -hmm. is it's related to humility. Because if you're curious about the world, mm -hmm. by definition, that means that you don't know everything already. And it means that you're eager to learn and that you're acknowledging that there are gaps in your knowledge. And uh, the best CEOs are highly curious and humble and uh, don't have what I've sometimes referred to as pathological certainty. Those are the worst CEOs, wow. the ones who feel like they have all the answers. Mm. That's very interesting. You know, I, I never thought of it like that, but curiosity is an important factor. That's fantastic. So I've got one more question for you from a coaching perspective before I move to the next segment. How long should an association be between a coach and a coachee, if I can use that term? Sure. The, my, my, uh, my, my first answer, which um, may sound a little bit glib, but I really don't mean it that way, and I'm actually quite serious about it, mm -hmm. is that, um, that most of my coaching relationships uh, with CEOs go for the duration of their tenure as the CEO. Wow. They are, because the, the nature of the relationship is an advisory one, and the nature of the CEO role is one that is constantly filled with situations and problems of, of an ambiguous and uncertain nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that the idea of having a sounding board throughout one's tenure as a leader can be very helpful. And many of my coaching relationships are, you know, have gone past the decade mark mm -hmm. for that very reason. It's, it's less about solving, you know, one or two or three problems and then you're finished. It's really more about being an ongoing resource to the CEO. And by the way, I often work not only with the CEO, but the entire management team and the board of directors as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, in the same way that they may have a, a lawyer who's a, an ongoing resource uh, in an indefinite uh, kind of open-ended kind of way. It's similar for a, for a coach. Fantastic. So now let me move to the last segment of our conversation, which are some questions for you personally. Sure. Can I, can I, you know, from a situation, as you just explained, parents who are Holocaust survivors, God, you got yourself such incredible education, uh, trained, re well recognized. What does success mean to Kerry? It's a, um, it's a question that I've thought about a lot over the years and in some ways my thinking has been catalyzed even further by the pandemic. Um, which I, which I think one of the silver linings of is that it it crystallizes a lot of soul searching mm -hmm. about what really uh, is important. Success is not about how much money I make. It's about having fulfilling experiences both on a personal level with my family members mm -hmm. and uh, with my clients and with my associates and with people in the human rights world, uh, doing things that are 
uh, important to not only to me but to others and that, that have some kind of lasting impact on the world. I'd like to think that by working with leaders, for instance, I can have an impact not only on them as individuals, but on the organizations they lead and on the quality of life and experience for uh, what in many cases is in, many, is in the many thousands and thousands of employees. So mm -hmm. the idea of leveraging whatever skill I hope to bring to bear on the lives of the, the leaders and the people that they impact is very meaningful uh, to me. That to me is success. and. Um, and having relationships with my with my daughters and with uh, the, my loved ones uh, that are that are also uh, meaningful and that give sustenance to everyone involved. Wonderful. And therefore, a follow up question for you is that you know you keep pushing the boundaries and doing different things, and you're also mm -hmm. working on human rights and so many things. Where do you draw your inspiration from? I, uh, I, I've had a bit of an entrep entrepreneurial streak, as you know, and I, I, I do like to keep trying new things. Um, I'm a little too restless to, uh, to do just one thing repeatedly for very long. Uh, although thematically, a lot of what I have been doing is, um, you know, it's been pretty consistent, I think, over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I draw inspiration from my daughters, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who are a source of wonder and inspiration to me every day. Uh, I draw inspiration from my partner, uh, who I'm here with in London, um, who is a source of, of, of wonder and, and great pleasure to me on so many levels. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I draw inspiration from some of the, the, the teachers that I've had over the years. And ironically, given what we were saying earlier, Ashutosh, about the term coach, mm. one of the most important people in my life was a sports coach that I had when I was in high school, a fencing coach. I was a, I was a fencer in my, in my youth. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he was a Frenchman in the, who came to the United States, Monsieur Neveu, uh, who died, sadly, but at the age of 99, uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, taught me to never give up, taught me to try even a little bit harder when the going gets tough, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and taught me the, you know, the, the value of persistence. So I, uh, I draw inspiration from, from his memory as well. Terrific. And now my last question to you, and I come back to the pandemic. And, you know, just before we started this conversation, you were telling me you were shuttling between the U.S. And, and the U.K. The pandemic has affected every one of us around the world. How are you rethinking your life in the new world order? I've been thinking about that quite a bit, uh, from both the practical to the perhaps philosophical level. On the practical level, certainly, I've learned that um, a lot more of my work can be done virtually, which gives me a lot more geographic flexibility. And it also frees up a certain amount of time to, to pursue some of my other interests that, I, uh, that were kind of crowded out by, by the constant travel that I was doing before. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the pandemic on a deeper level has underscored for me the fragility of life and of the planet mm -hmm. and of, of our interconnectedness. It has also highlighted for me in a, in a tragic kind of way how those people who are far less fortunate uh, than we are uh, are the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and um, have been the most profoundly affected in a negative way by the, by the pandemic. So it makes me want to redouble my efforts to, um, to try to do some good beyond my immediate circle. And, uh, and to see if I can have some impact on some of the challenges that the, that the world faces in public health and the political divides that we have and so forth and the climate. Fantastic. Kerry, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. I wish you and everything that you're doing and uh, your new life in London, I wish you lots of success and lots of happiness. Thank you so much. It's always great to talk to you, Ashutosh. Really good to see you here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.